All right, you guys, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. And in today's lesson, we're going to be taking a look at something that's been coming up as discussion. I've seen it in a lot of different places, and I've seen people asking questions uh, because they've heard people talking about this. And that's going to be about the theory of there being two different types of phenotypes of COVID-19. And this should hopefully be a pretty quick lesson, so make sure you guys stay tuned to catch all the info that I'm going to share here. That said, though, if this is your first time to this channel and you'd be interested in more critical care educational videos such as this one here, make sure and subscribe to the channel down below. Make sure you hit that bell icon, though, and select all notifications. That way you'll never miss out on a new lesson. And as always, a special shout out to our awesome Patreon subscribers. The support that you guys provide is incredible, and I, I really am appreciative of you guys. If you're not already a member and you'd be interested in potentially showing additional support, then head on over there and take a look at some of the awesome perks that are available only on the, the Patreon page. All right, and with that said, let's go ahead and dive on into the lesson. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. All right, so L and H phenotypes of COVID-19. So the point of this lesson is that there's really been a lot of discussion and speculation about COVID-19 and whether or not these patients are in ARDS as we commonly know it. We seem to see patients with different presentations of this disease, uh, and it really kind of varies from patient to patient. And in fact, I'm sure some of you have probably even heard people make comments or say things such as this isn't actually ARDS or, or COVID-19 isn't a typical ARDS. And so the point of this lesson is to, to take a look at, at one theory that kind of addresses some of these issues that have come up and really have led people to kind of think like this. But it's this evaluation of these different presentations of these patients that really resulted in uh, a physician by the name of Dr. Gattinoni, as well as others, to, to get together and kind of classify things and really propose that they see two different phenotypes that we see in patients with COVID-19. And the importance of this particular theory and why I really want to kind of emphasize it is, one, because you, you just hear a lot of people that reference this and kind of have this way of thinking. Um, but this Dr. Gattinoni, he's actually one of the lead researchers on ARDS over the last couple of decades. So uh, he's definitely someone who knows what he's talking about. And in his own words, he states that COVID-19 is not ARDS. And so it's really kind of interesting, and we'll go into some of the reasoning behind why he thinks that. But a, a lot of this is actually covered in a paper that he, along with others, released titled COVID-19 Pneumonia, Different Respiratory Treatment for Different Phenotype. And essentially what he's saying is that most patients aren't meeting the Berlin definition of ARDS because what we're seeing is patients with hypoxemia with this normal compliance. And in fact, he points out that they, they've seen 50% or more of their patients presenting this way. And if this is the case, this is really a remarkable combination and, and not something that we normally see typically in ARDS. Other things that really kind of drove them to wanting to try and classify what's going on here is they noted some key distinct differences in some patients with COVID-19. There was the happy hypoxic versus the severely dyspneic. There were those who were responders to nitric oxide and those who were not, as well as those patients who presented with deep hypocapnia as opposed to those with normal or even hypercapnia. And finally, those that seemed to be responsive to prone positioning and those that weren't. And so as a result, it led this group to describe physiological findings in COVID pneumonia. And this is really a spectrum of a disease with two primary phenotypes. First is going to be our type L, and the other is going to be our type H. And so we'll start off talking about the, the type L phenotype here. And really, we can kind of think of this as things being classified together as being low. So in this phenotype, we're going to see patients who have low elastins. And elastins is the reciprocal of compliance, so basically this means that we have high compliance. Now these patients are going to have normal compliance, so we can almost think of this as like a normal lung. Now with these patients, we're also going to see a low VQ ratio, or essentially a low ventilation to perfusion ratio. And so basically what this means is we, we have this mismatch of perfusion. We're not going to be adequately perfusing the alveoli. And so we're going to see this hypoxemia related to this perfusion dysregulation, hypoxic vasoconstriction, as well as the pulmonary capillary microthrombi. The other thing that we're going to see with patients with this phenotype is going to be low lung weight. And really what I mean by this is that they're going to have dry lungs. 
And this is going to be especially when we compare them with other pneumonia or other typical ARD syndromes, where we're just not going to see the diffuse infiltrates and edema. And this is where on the CT scan, you're going to have that ground glass appearance, but it's going to be in the subpleural tissue. And here when I'm talking about low lung weight, if you really think about it, if we don't have that additional fluid like we typically see in ARDS, we're not going to have those wet, heavy lungs, hence them being dry and having that low lung weight. And finally, the last thing that we're going to see is low lung recruitability. And this is going to be because we have a low amount of non-aerated tissue. And so what this means is that our alveoli and our, our lung regions are going to be open, so we're, we're really not going to be able to recruit lung units using pressure. And so on this L phenotype, really what they propose is that most early COVID patients are going to appear this way with this phenotype. And it's some of the features in here that really could explain the, the lack of dyspnea that we sometimes see early on in these patients. And that's because that they're really not working hard to, to get their air in. They don't have to exert their work of breathing. And so we know our normal physiological response to hypoxemia is to increase our minute ventilation. And in the case of the L phenotype here, the patients are going to be able to get the air that they expect. So they're not going to have that dyspnea. Uh, and this could also potentially lead to that hypocapnia. And so they go on to say that 70 to 80 percent of the patients that we see are going to have this L-type phenotype. And so what they talk about in this paper is patients who will present with the L-type may stay there for a while and eventually either progress to improving or could also progress to worsening. And so they talk about some factors uh, such as the increased permeability due to the inflammation that's going on resulting in edema as well as negative intrathoracic pressure can also contribute to this. And this is actually a result of something that's referred to as patient self-inflicted lung injury. Now, eventually this increasing edema can lead to atelectasis and ultimately decrease gas volume. And so this is when the dyspnea develops in these patients, which can worsen those things that I just talked about there and ultimately lead to a transition to the H phenotype. And so with that transition, let's actually talk about the type H phenotype here. And this is one that we can think of it as being associated with things that are going to be high. Here, we're actually going to have a high elastance, which as we know, means that they're going to have a low compliance, and this is going to lead to higher pressure required to give them their volume. Here, we're also going to see a high right to left shunt, and this is because a fraction of our patient's cardiac output is going to go to perfusing across poorly aerated lung tissue, and this we're going to see develop in the dependent lung regions. Here, we're also going to see high lung weight, and so again, we can think of this as being wet lungs, and this is because their lungs are going to be full of inflammatory fluid on the order of severe ARDS. And finally, we're going to see high lung recruitability. And so what this means is that using PEEP, we may actually be able to recruit collapsed fluid-filled segments of lung. And so hearing this stuff about the H phenotype, you can really think about this as being like classic ARDS. And so they believe that 20 to 30% of what we see is going to be this H-type presentation or this like classic ARDS presentation. All right, so that describes the, the two different type of phenotypes that they propose. In this paper, though, they also propose some respiratory treatment for this. So first and foremost, we want to reduce our patient's hypoxemia with increased FiO2. And here the L-type patients are going to respond well to this, especially when they're not dyspneic. Now, if we do have L-type patients with dyspnea, then they suggest using one of several types of non-invasive ventilation. So this means high-flow nasal cannula, CPAP, BiPAP, things like that. They do recommend monitoring esophageal manometry, or if you don't have that, you can be on the lookout for pressure swings in your CVP or be watching for that excessive inspiratory effort. They also recommend monitoring airway occlusion pressure. And so things like high PEEP may actually decrease the pleural pressure swings that we were just talking about and could prevent the, the lung injury. Important to know, though, that this may impact the hemodynamics in patients who have the normal lung compliance. Now, they did note, though, that non-invasive ventilation may be associated with high failure rates as well as delayed intubations. 
So really something to be considering when you're considering the use of that non-invasive ventilation. Now they make specific mention here, and it's important to know that it's these large pressure swings, the pleural pressure swings that may lead to that transition from L-type to H-type. And this is because it could be increasing risk of injury to the lung tissue. Now, once we reach to the point to where we intubate these patients and we have them sedated, they do say that hypercapnia can be resolved in these L-type patients by using larger tidal volumes without the risk of ventilator-induced lung injury. Here they recommend prone as a rescue maneuver, dropping PEEP to 8 to 10 centimeters of water, and this is really due to the, the risk of hemodynamic failure, as well as utilizing early intubation to help prevent possibly that transition to H-type. And then finally, once we do say that we are dealing with the type H patients, is we want to treat this like severe ARDS. And so this means using things like high PEEP or APRV, now utilizing prone positioning for all patients, as well as the possible use of ECMO. So those are the ways in which they've kind of developed and come together and, and really how to treat these patients depending on the, the type of phenotype that they're presenting with. And so last and but not least, I, I do want to present some of the potential issues that come up with when we're possibly considering the accuracy or the efficacy of this theory. So I'm just going to go through these real quickly, but some of the points that are that are out there that, that raise some suspicion or concern would be that, one, there's just not a lot of data so, to support this theory. In addition to that, the, the management that they propose for the, the type L phenotype really goes against everything that, that we know for our typical ARDS treatment. And this is really going to be a result of the, the low PEEP and the high tidal volumes. Now to kind of go against some of, of what they talk about and some of what they say that we see with these patients is there was a retrospective study done in Boston that actually shows low compliance from the start. They had a median time of seven days with the illness before they presented to the hospital. Now, in addition to that, the hospital that they were going to also avoided non-invasive ventilation, uh, high flow nasal cannula. And so as a result, it led to early intubation, which really gave us a, a lot of numbers and a lot of insight into some of the early COVID-19 expectations. Now, the data from this Boston study, as well as another study in Seattle, suggested that compliance does not actually decrease over time, and in fact, it may have some increase. And finally, one of the things that they talk about in their recommendation and the treatment of the, the L phenotype is saving prone therapy for a rescue maneuver, but we've actually seen a lot of benefit from early proning of these patients, even before they're intubated, and not using it just as a rescue therapy. So those are some of the, the issues that have come up, some of the things that have brought into question some of the stuff that they've, they've talked about. But it is very interesting, and I, I just wanted to present this information to you guys so that you could compare it against some of what you're hearing out there as well as some of what you guys are seeing in your patients and to kind of see if some of it lines up with what's going on here. Again, the, the head doctor that put together this theory in this paper is a pretty renowned physician when it comes to looking at ARDS. And again, from his words, he's saying that this isn't ARDS. So definitely something worth considering and, and looking into, uh, and potentially it could lead to other potential studies that look at some of the different management that we might be able to do for these patients. All right, and so with that said, that's going to end this lesson here. I really hope that you guys uh, enjoyed this lesson. If you did, go down below, hit that like button. Uh, it really goes a long way to help support this channel in, in terms of the YouTube algorithm. Uh, check out some of the awesome merch that I also have down below the video here. I'm continually adding new designs on there that I think you guys might really enjoy. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you guys would be interested in showing more support via the, the Patreon page, I'm going to put a link. Go ahead and head on over there. Check out some of the, the extra content that's not available just here on the YouTube page. Uh, if not though, truly you're, you're watching and liking videos, commenting and, and sharing the videos here, that is truly supportive of this channel as well. And so thank you guys so much. With that said, I, I hope you guys have a, a great day and we'll see you in the next lesson.